James and the Giant Peach is the book I will read now for you in ASMR style. So put your headphones in and listen. Hello my beloved mouse, I am happy to see you here on a new ASMR clip where I read the book James and the Giant Peach. It is a very thick book so I think I will read it in different kind of sessions. This is now the first session where I will start with the book. The book is written by Rohal Dahl and here I have the full book collection I work myself through. So if you are a fan of listening to someone who read for you in ASMR style stories, then it is more than worth it to follow, to subscribe, to click on the notification bell and to comment here to support this YouTube channel. I have two cameras, one here and one there, so I also will make a video clip where you can see inside of the book because there are some illustrations as well. So let us start. And if you are curious about way more book from Roald Dahl, then feel free to check all my videos and see all the other Rohal Dahl books I read. And for the best sound, put your headphones in because this is a high quality recording. And when you want to enjoy the crystal clear sound, then it makes sense to put the headphones in your ear that you actually can Listen to the quality I provide for you. Introducing James Henry Trotter, Aunt Spiker, Aunt Sponge, Old Green Grasshopper, Centipede, Miss Spider, Silky Worm, Glowworm, Earthworm and Ladybird. This book is for Olivia and Tessa. One. Until he was four years old, James Henry Trotter had a happy life. He left peacefully his mother and father in a beautiful house beside the sea. There were always plenty of other children for him to play with. And there was the sandy beach for him to run about on and the ocean to paddle in. It was a perfect life for a small boy. Then... One day, James' mother and father went to London to do some shopping, and there a terrible thing happened. Both of them suddenly got eaten up in full daylight by an enormous angry rhinoceros, which headed from the London Zoo. Now, this, as you can all imagine, was a rather nasty experience for two such gentle parents. But in the long run, it was far nastier for James than it was for them. Their troubles were all over in Jiffy. They were dead and gone in 35 seconds flat. Poor James, on the hand, was still very much alive. And all at once, 
he found himself alone and frightened in a vast, unfriendly world. The lovely house by the seaside had to be sold immediately and the little boy carrying nothing but a small suitcase containing a pair of pyjamas and a toothbrush was sent away to live with his two aunts. Their names were Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker, and I'm sorry to say that they were both really horrible people. They were selfish and lazy and cruel, and right from the beginning they started beating poor James for almost no reason at all. They never called him by his real name, but always referred him as you disgusting little beast or you filthy nuisance, or you miserable creature. And they certainly never gave him any toys to play with or any picture books to look at. His room was a bear as a prison cell. They lived, Aunt Sponge, Aunt Spiker, and now James as well, in a queer ramshackle house on the top of High Hill in the south of England. The hill was so high that from almost anywhere in the garden James could look down and see for miles and miles across a marvelous landscape of woods and fields. And on a very clear day, if he looked in the right direction, he could see a tiny gray dot far away on the horizon, which was the house that he used to live in with his beloved mother and father. And just beyond that, he could see the ocean itself, a long, thin streak of black shell blue, like a line of ink beneath the rim of the sky. But James was never allowed to go down off the top of the hill. Neither Aunt Sponge nor Aunt Spike could ever be bothered to take him out herself, not even for a small walk or picnic. And he curtainly was not permitted to go alone. The nasty little beast will only get into mischief if he goes out of the garden, Aunt Spiker has said, and terrible punishments were promised him. Such as being locked up in a cellar with the rats for a week, if he even so much as dare to climb over the fence. The garden, which covered the whole of the top of the hill, was large and desolate, and the only tree in the entire place was an ancient peach tree that never gave any peaches. There was no swing, no seesaw, no sand pit, and no other children were ever invited to come up to the hill to play with poor James. There wasn't much as a dog or cat around to keep him company. And as time went on, he became sadder and sadder and more and more lonely. And he used to spend hours every day standing at the bottom of the garden, gazing wisefully at the lovely forbidden world of woods and fields and ocean that was spread out below him like a magic carpet. Two. After James, Henry Trotter had been living with his aunt for three whole years, there came a morning when something rather peculiar happened to him. And this thing, which as I saw, was only rather peculiar, soon caused a second thing to happen, which was very peculiar. And then very peculiar thing in its own turn caused a really fantastically peculiar thing to occur. It all started on a blazing hot day in the middle of the summer. Aunt Sponge, Aunt Spiker and James were all out in the garden. James had been put to work as usual. This time he was chopping wood for the kitchen stove. Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker were sitting comfortably in deck chairs nearby, sipping the glasses of fizzy lemonade and watching him to see that he didn't stop work for a moment. Aunt Sponge 
was enormously fat and very short. She had small piggy eyes and sunken mouth and one of those white flap faces that looked exactly as salt had been boiled. She was like a great white soggy overboiled cabbage. Aunt Spiker, on the other hand, was lean and tall and bony. And she wore a steel rimmed spectacle that fixed on the end of her nose with a clip. She had a screeching voice and long, wet, narrow lips. And whenever she got angry or excited, little flecks of spit would come shouting out of her mouth as she talked. And there they sat, these two ghastly hags sipping their drinks and every now and again screaming at James to chop faster and faster. They also talked about themselves, each one saying how beautiful she thought she was. Old Sponge had a long-handled mirror on the lap, and she kept picking it up and gazing at her own. I look and smell, Aunt Sponge declared, as lovely as Rose. Just feast your eyes upon my face, observe my sharply nose. Behold my heavenly silky locks, and if I take off past my socks, you see my dainty toes, but don't forget how much your tummy shows. Aunt Sponge went red, Aunt Spike said, my sweet you cannot win, behold my gorgeous curve shape, my teeth and my charming grin. Oh, beauties me, how I adore my rad radiant looks, and please ignore the pimple in my chin. My dear old trout, on sponge cried, you only bones and skin. Such loveliness as the possess can only truly shine in Hollywood, Aunt Sponge declared. Oh, wouldn't that be fine. I capture all the nation hearts that give me all the leading parts. The stars would all resign. I think you make, Aunt Spiker said, A lovely Frankenstein. Poor James was living away the chopping block. The heat was terrible. He was sweating all over. His arm was arching. The chopper was a large blunt thing, far too heavy for a small boy to use. And as he worked, James began thinking about all the other children in the world and what they might be doing at this moment. Some would be riding tricycles in the gardens. Some would be walking in the cool woods and picking bunches of wildflowers. And all the little friends whom he has to know would be down by the seaside, playing in the wet sand and splashing around in the water. Great tears began oozing out of James' eyes and rolling down his cheeks. He stopped working and landed against the chopping block, overwhelmed by his own unhappiness. What's the matter with you? Aunt Spicker screeched, glaring him over the top of her steel spectacles. James began to cry. Stop that immediately and get on with your work, you nasty little beast, Aunt Sponge ordered. Oh, Auntie Sponge, James cried out, and Auntie Spiker, couldn't we all, please, just for once, go down to the seaside or on the bus? It isn't very far and I feel so hot and awful and lonely. Why, you lazy good-for-nothing brute, Aunt Spiker shouted. Beat him, cried Aunt Sponge. I certainly will. She glared at James and James looked back at her with a large frightened eyes. I shall beat you later on in the day when I don't feel so hot, she said. And now get out of my sight, you disgusting little worm, and give me some peace. James turned and ran. He ran off as fast as he could to the far end of the garden and hide himself behind the clamp of dirty old laurel 
bushes that we maintained earlier on. Then he covered his face with his hands and began to cry. It was at this point that the first thing of all, the rather peculiar thing that let so many other much more peculiar things happen to him. For suddenly, just behind him, James heard a rustling of leaves and he turned around and saw an old man in a funny dark green suit emerging from the bushes. He was a very small old man, but he had a huge bald head and a face that was covered all over with black whiskers. He stopped when he was about three years away and she stood there leaning on his stick and staring hard at James. When he spoke, his voice was very slow and cracky. Come closer to me, little boy, he said. Come right up close to me, and I will show you something. Something wonderful. James was too frightened to move. The old man hauled a stuck or to nearer, and then he put a hand into the pocket of his jacket and took out a small white paper bag. You see this? he whispered, waving the bag gently to and fro in front of James' face. You know what this is, my dear. You know what's inside this little bag. Then he came nearer. Still leaning forward and pushing his face so close to James that James could feel the breath blowing on his cheeks. The breath smelled musty and stale and slightly melted like air in an old cellar. Take a look, my dear, he said, opening the bag and tightening it towards James. Inside it, James could see a mess of tiny green things that looked like little stones or crystals, each one about the size of grain, of rice. They were extraordinarily beautiful. And there was a strange brightness about them. A sort of luminous quality that made them glow and sparkle in the most wonderful way. Listen to them, the old man whispered. Listen to the move. James stared into the back, and sure enough, there was a faint rustling sound coming up from inside it. And then he noticed that all the thousands of little green things were slowly, very slowly stirring about and moving over each other as thought they were alive. There's more power and magic in those things in there than in all the rest of the world put together, the old man said softly. But what are they, James mourned, finding his voice. Where do they come from? Ah, the old man whispered. You never guess it. He was crouching a little now and pushing his face still closer and closer to James until the tip of his long nose was actually touching the skin of James' forehead. Then suddenly he jumped back and began waving his stick madly in the air. Crocodile tongues, he cried. One thousand long slimy crocodile tongues boiled up in skull of a dead witch for twenty days a night with the eyeball of a lizard. At the fingers of a young monkey, the gizzard of a pig, the peak of green parrot, the juice of porcupine, and three spoonfuls of sugar. Stew for another week, and then let the moon do the rest. All at once, he pushed the white paper back into James' hand and said, Here, you take it. It is yours. 4. James Henry Trotter stood there clutching the bag and staring at the old man. And now, the old man said, all you got to do is this. 
Take a large stretch of water and pull all the little green things into it. Then, very slowly, one by one, at ten hairs from your own head. That sets them off. It gets them going. In a couple of minutes, the water will begin to froth a bubble furiously, and as so as it happens, you must quickly drink it all down, the whole judgeful, in one gulp. And then, my dear, you will feel a churning and boiling in your stomach, and steam will start coming out of your mouth. And immediately after that marvelous things will start happening to you, fabulous, unbelievable things. And you will never be miserable again in your life. Because you are miserable, aren't you? You needn't tell me. I know all about it. Now, off you go and do exactly as I say. And don't whisper a word of this to those who who are horrible aunt of yours, not a word. And don't let those green things in there get away from you either, because if they do escape, then they will be working their magic upon somebody else instead upon you. And that isn't what you want at all. Is it, my dear? Whoever they meet first, be it a bug, insect, animal or tree, That will be one who gets the full power of their magic. So hold the back tight. Don't tear the paper. Off you go. Hurry up. Don't wait. Now's the time. Hurry. With that, the old man turned away and disappeared in the bushes. Five. The next moment, James was running back toward the house as fast as he could go. He would do it all in the kitchen, he told himself. If only he could get in there without Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker seeing him. He was terrible ex exhausted. He flew through the long grass on the stingy nettles, not caring whether he got stung or not on his bare knees. And in distance he could see Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker sitting in their chairs with their backs towards him. He swerved away from them so as to go around the other side of the house. But then, suddenly, just as he was passing underneath the old peach tree that stood in the middle of the garden, his foot slipped and he fell flat on his face in the grass. The paper bag burst open as it hit the ground and thousand of tiny green things was hacked with in a directions. James immediately picked himself up on his hands and knees and searching around his precious treasures. But what was this? They were all sinking into the soil. He could actually see them wringing and twisting as they burrowed their way down into the hard earth and at once... He reached out a hand to pick some of them up before it was too late, but they disappeared right under his fingers. He went after some others and the same thing happened. He began swimming around frantically in a fall to catch hold of those that were left, but they were too quick of him. Each time the tips of his fingers were just about to touch them, they vanished into the earth. And soon, in the space of only a few seconds, every single one of them had gone. James felt like crying. He would never get them back now. They was lost forever. But where had they done gone? And why in the world had they been so eager to push down into the earth like that? What were they after? There was nothing down there, nothing except the roots of the old peach tree and a whole lot of earthworms and centipedes and insects living in the soil. But what was it the old man had said? Whoever they meet first, be it a bug, an insect, animal or tree, that will be the one who get the full power of their magic. Good heaven, saw James. What is going to happen in that case if they do meet an earthworm or a centipede or a spider? And what if they go into the roots 
on the peach tree. Get up at once, you lazy little beast, a voice was suddenly shouting. James glanced up and saw on Spiker standing over him. Grim and tall and bony glaring at him through her steel-rimmed spectacles. Get back over there immediately and finish chopping up those logs, she ordered. Aunt Sponge, fat and pulpy as a yellfish, came waddling up behind her sister to see what was going on. Why don't we just lower the boy we down the well in a bucket and leave him there for a night, she suggests. That ought to teach him not to lazy around like this whole day long. That's a very good wheeze, my dear sponge, but let's make him a finished chopping of the wood first. Be off with you at once, you hide house bread, and do some work. Slowly, sadly, poor James got up off the ground and went back to the wood pile. Oh, if I only he hadn't slipped and fallen and dropped that precious bag. All hope of happier life had gone completely now. Today and tomorrow and the next day and all the other days as well would be nothing but punishment and pain and unhappiness and despair. He picked up the chopper and was just about to start chopping away again when he heard a shout behind them, mad him stop and turn. Six. Sponge, sponge, come here at once and look at this. At what? It's a peach, Aunt Spiker was shouting. A what? A peach, right up there on the highest branch. Can you see it? I think you must be mistaken, my dear Spike. That miserable tree had never a peach once. There's one. You look for yourself. You're teasing me, Spiker. You're making my mouth water on paupers when there's nothing to put in it. Why, the trees never even had a blossom on it. Right up on the highest branch, you say. I can't see a thing. Very funny. What gorgeous me. Well, I will blow. There's really as a peach up there. A nice big one too, Aunt Spiker said. A beauty, Aunt Sponge cried out. At this point, James slowly put down his chopper and turned and looked across at the two women who were standing underneath the peach tree. Something is about to happen, he told himself. Something peculiar is about to happen any moment. He hadn't the faintest idea what it might be, but he could feel it in his bones that something was going to happen soon. He could feel it in the air around him and the sudden stillness that had fallen upon the garden. James tippy-toed a little closer to the tree. The owls were not talking now. They were just standing there, staring at the peach. There was not a sound anywhere. Not even a breath of wind and overhead the sun blazed down upon them out of the deep blue sky. It looks ripe to me, Aunt Speaker said, breaking the silence. Then why don't we eat it, Aunt Sponge suggested, licking her thick lips. We can't have a half each. Hey you, James, come over here at once and climb this tree. James came running over. I want you to pick the peach up there on the highest branch, Out Sponge went on. Can you see it? Yes, Out Sponge, I can see it. And don't you dare eat any of it yourself. Your own Spiker and I are going to have it between us, right here and now, half each. Get one with it. Up you go. James crossed over the three trunk. Stop, Aunt Spike said quickly. Hold everything. She was staring up in the branches with her mouth wide open and her eyes bulging as though she had seen a ghost. Look, she said. What's the matter with you, Aunt Sponge demanded. 
It's growing, Unspike cried. It's getting bigger and bigger. What is the peach? Of course. You're joking. Well, look for yourself. But my dear Spiker, that's perfectly ridiculous. That's impossible. That's, that's, no, wait, just a minute. No, that can't be right. No, yes. Great, Scott. The thing really is growing. It's nearly twice as big already, Aunt Spiker shouted. It can't be true. It is true. It must be a miracle. Watch it. I am watching it. Great heavens alive, Aunt Speaker yelled. I can actually see the thing bulging and swelling before my very eyes. Seven. The two women and the small boy stood absolutely still on the grass underneath the tree, gazing up at this extraordinary fruit. James, little face was glowing with excitement. His eyes were as big and bright as the two stars. He could see the peach swelling larger and larger, as clearly as if it were a balloon being blown up. In a half a minute, it was the size of a melon. In another half minute, it was twice as big again. Just look at it growing, Aunt Spiker cried. Will it ever stop? Aunt Sponge shouted, waving her fat arms and starting to dance around in cycles. And now it was so big, it looked like an enormous butter-colored pumpkin, dangling from the top of the tree. Get away from the tree trunk, you stupid boy, Aunt Spiker yelled. The slightest shake and I'm sure it fall off. It must weigh 20 or 30 pounds at least. The branch that the peach was growing upon was beginning to bend over, further and further because of the weight. Stand back, Aunt Sponge shouted. It's coming down. The branch is going to break. But the branch didn't break. It simply bent over more and more as the peach got heavier and heavier. And still it went on growing. In another minute, this mermaid fruit was a large and round and fat as Aunt Sponge herself. And probably just as heavy. It has to stop now, Aunt Speaker yelled. It can't go on forever. But it didn't stop. Soon it was the size of a small car and reached halfway to the ground. Both aunts were now hopping round and round the tree, clapping their hands and shouting all sorts of silly things in their excitement. Hallelujah, Aunt Spiker shouted. What a peach. Terrific, Aunt Sponge cried out. Magnificent. And what a meal. It's still growing. I know. As for James, he was spellbound by the whole thing that he could only stand and stare and murmur quietly to himself. Oh, isn't it beautiful? It's the most beautiful thing I ever seen. Shut up, little twerp, Aunt Spiker snapped, happening to overhear him. It's none of your business. That's right, Aunt Sponge declared. It's got nothing to do with whatsoever. Keep out of it. Look, Aunt Spiker shouted. It's growing faster than ever now. It's speeding up. I see it, Spiker. I do. Bigger and bigger grew the peach, bigger and bigger. Then, at least when it had come nearly as tall as the three that it was growing on, as tall and wide in fact as a small house, the bottom part of it gently touched the ground, and there it rested. It can fall off now, Aunt Spockhunch out. 
It stopped growing, Aunt Spiker cried. No, it hasn't. Yes, it has. It's slowing down, Spiker. It's slowing down. But it hasn't stopped yet. You watch it. There was a pause. It has now. I believe you're right. Do you think it's safe to touch it? I don't know. We better be careful. Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker began walking slowly around the beach, inspecting it very consciously from all sides. They were like a couple of hunters who had just shot an elephant and were not quite sure whether it was dead or alive and the massive round fruit toward over them so high that they looked like midgets from another world beside it. Then, skin of the peach was very beautiful, a rich buttery yellow with patches of brilliant pink and red. Aunt Sponge advanced cautiously and touched it with the tip of one finger. It's ripe, she cried. It's just perfect. Now look at her, Spiker. Why don't we go and get a shovel right away and dig out a great big chunk of it? For you and for me to eat? No, Aunt Spiker said, not yet. Why ever? No. Because I say so. But I can't wait to eat some, Aunt Sponge cried out. She was watering at the mouth now, and the thin crickle of spit was running down on the side of her chin. My dear sponge, Aunt Spiker said slowly, winking at her sister and smiling a sly, thin-lipped smile. There is a pile of money to be made out of this, if only we can handle it right. You wait and see. Eight. The news that the peach almost as big as a house had suddenly appeared in someone's garden spread like a wildfire across the countryside. And the next day, a stream of people came scrambling up the steep hill to gaze upon this marvel. Quickly, Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker called in carpenters and had them build a strong fence around the peach to save it from the crowd. And at the same time, these two crafty women stationed themselves at the front gate with a large bunch of tickets and started charging everyone for coming in. Roll up, Aunt Spiker yelled, only the shilling to see the giant peach. Half a price for children under six weeks old, Aunt Sponge shouted. One at a time, please. Don't push. You are all going to get in. Hey, you, come back there. You haven't paid. By lunchtime, the whole place was a seating mass of men, women and children, all pushing and shoving to get a glimpse of this miracle's fruit. Helicopters were landing like wasps all over the hill and out of them poured swarms of newspaper reporters, cameramen, and men from the television companies. It all will cost you double to bring in cameras, Aunt Spike shouted. All right, they answered. We don't care. And the money came rolling into the pockets of the true greedy aunts. But while all this excitement was going on outside, Poor James was forced to stay locked in his bedroom, peeping through the bars of his window at the crowds below. The disgusting little brute will only get in everyone's way if we let him wander about. Aunt Spiker had said early this morning. Oh, please, he had begged. I haven't met any other children for years and there are going to be lots of them down there for me to play with. And perhaps I could help you with the tickets. Shut up, Aunt Sponge had snapped. Your Aunt Spiker and I are about to become millionaires. And the last thing we want to see is you messing things up and getting in the way. Later, when the evening of the first day came in, the poor had all gone home. 
The owls unlocked James' door and ordered him to get outside and pick up all the banana skin and orange peel and bits of paper that Kraut had left behind. Could I please have something to eat first, he asked. I haven't had a thing all day. No, they shouted, kicking him out of the door. We are too busy to make food. We are counting money. But it's dark, cried James. Get out, they yelled, and stay out until you cleaned up all the mess. The door slammed. The key turned in the lock. Nine. Hungry and trembling, Jane stood alone out in the open wondering what to do. The night was all around him now, and high overhead a wild white moon was riding in the sky. There was not a sound, not a move. Nothing. Most people, and especially small children, are often quite scared of being outdoors alone in the moonlight. Everything is deadly quiet, and the shadows are so long and black and they kept turning into strange shapes that seem to move as you look at them and the slightest little snap or twig makes you jump. James felt exactly like that now. He stared straight ahead with the large frightened eyes, hardly daring to breathe. Not far away, in the middle of the garden, he could see the giant peach towering over everything else. Surely it was even bigger tonight than ever before. And what a dazzling sight it was. The moonlight was shining and glinting on its great curving sides, turning them to the crystal and silver. It looked like a tremendous silver ball lying there in the grass, silent, mysterious and wonderful. And then, all at once, little shivers of excitement started running over the skin on James' back. Something else, he told himself, something stranger than ever this time is about to happen to me again soon. He was sure of it. He could feel it coming. He looked around him, wondering what on earth it was going to be. The garden lay soft and silver in the moonlight. The grass was wet with dew and a million dewdrops were sparkling and twinkling like diamonds around his feet. And now, suddenly the whole place, the whole garden seemed to be alive with magic. Almost without knowing what he was doing, a thought drawn by the same power magnet. James Henry Trotter started to walk slowly towards the giant peach. He climbed over the fence to the giant that rounded it and stood directly beneath it, staring up at its great bulging sides. He put out a hand and touched it gently with the tip of a finger. It felt soft and warm and slightly furry, like the skin of a baby mouse. He moved a step closer and rubbed his cheek lightly against the soft skin, and then suddenly, While he was doing this, he happened to notice that the right beside him and below him, close to the ground, there was a hole in the side of the peach. 10. It was a quite large hole. The thought of thing an animal about the size of a fox might have made. James knelt down in front of it and poked his head and shoulders inside. He crawled in. He kept on crawling. This isn't a hole, he thought. It's a tunnel. The tunnel was damp and murky, and all around him there was a curious bittersweet smell of fresh peach. The floor was soggy under his skin. The walls were wet and sticky, and peach juice was dripping from the ceiling. James opened his mouth and caught some of a woman's tongue. It tasted delicious. He was crawling up and now and thought the tunnel were leading straight towards the very center of the giant fruit. Every few seconds he paused and took a bit out of the wall. The peach flesh was sweet and juicy and marvelous refreshing. 
He crawled on for several mil yards and then suddenly, bang, the top of his head bumped into something extremely hard blocking the way. He glanced up. In front of him, there was a solid wall that seemed at first as tough it were made of wood. He th touched it as with his fingers. It certainly felt like wood, except that it was very jacked and full of deep grooves. Good heavens, he said, I know what this is. I've come to a stone in the middle of the peach. Then he noticed that there was a small door cut into the face of this peach stone. He gave a push. It swung open. He crawled through it, and before he had time to glance up and see where he was, he heard a voice saying, Look who's here, and another one, We've been waiting for you. James stopped and stared at the speakers. His face was white with horror. He started to stand up, but his knees were shaking so much he had to sit down again on the floor. He glanced behind him, thinking he could bolt back into the tunnel the way he had come, but the doorway had disappeared. There was only a solid brown wall behind him. 11. James' large, frightened eyes traveled slowly around the room. The creators, some sitting on chairs, others sitting on a sofa, were all watching him intently. Creators? Or were they insects? An insect is a usual something rather small, is it not? A grasshopper, for example, is an insect. So what would you call it if you saw a grasshopper as large as a dog? As large as a large dog. You could hardly call that an insect, could you? There was an old green grasshopper as large as a dog sitting directly across the room from James now. And next to the old green grasshopper, there was an enormous spider. And next to the spider, there was a giant ladybird with nine black spots on her scale shell. Each of the three was squatting upon a magnificent chair. On a sofa nearby, recently comfortable, curled up position, there were a centipede and an earthworm. And the floor, over in the far corner, there was something thick and white that looked as thought it might be a silkworm. But it was sleeping soundly and nobody was paying any attention to it. Everyone on this creatures was at least as big as James himself, and the strange greenish light that showed down from somewhere in the ceiling, they were absolutely terrifying to behold. I'm hungry, the spider announced suddenly, staring at James. I am famished, the old green grasshopper said. So am I, the ladybird cried. The centipede sat up a little straighter on the sofa. Everyone's famished, he said. We need food. Four pairs round black glassy eyes were all fixed upon James. The centipede made a wriggling move with his body and thought he were about to glide off the sofa, but he didn't. There was a long pause and a long silence. The spider, who happened to be a female spider, opened her mouth and ran a long black tongue directly over her lips. Aren't you hungry, she asked, suddenly leaning forward and addressed herself to James. Poor James was packed up against the far wall, shivering with fright and much too terrified to answer. What's the matter with you? the old green grasshopper asked. You like positively ill. He looks as thought he's going to faint any second, the centipede said. Oh my goodness, the poor thing, the ladybird cried. I do believe he thinks it's him that we're wanting to eat. There was a roar of laughter from all the sides. 
Oh dear, they said, what an awful thought. You mustn't be frightened, the lady burst in kindly. We wouldn't dream of hurting you. You are one of us now, didn't you know that? You are one of the crew. We are all in the same boat. We've been waiting for you all day long. The old green grasshopper said, We thought you were never going to turn up. I'm glad you made it. So cheer up, my boy, cheer up, the centipede said. And meanwhile, I wish you'd come over here and give me a hand with those boots. It makes, took me for hours to get all of them off by myself. 12. James decided that his was most certainly not a time to be disarranged. So he crossed the room to where the centipedes was sitting and knelt down beside him. Thank you so much, the centipede said. You are very kind. You have a lot of boots, James mourned. I have a lot of legs, the centipede answered proudly, and a lot of feet. One hundred to be exact. There he goes again, the earthworm cried, speaking for the first time. He simply cannot stop telling lies about his legs. He doesn't have anything like a hundred of them. He's only go forty-two. The trouble is that most people don't bother to count them. They just take his word. And anyway, there's nothing marvelous, you know, centipede about having a lot of legs. Poor fellow, the centipede said, whispering in James' ear. He's blind. He can see how splendid I look. In my opinion, the earthworm said, the rarely marvelous thing is to have no legs at all and to be able to walk just the same. You call that walking, cried the centipede. You are a sliderer. That's all you are. You just slide along. I glide, said the earthworm primarily. You are a slimy beast, answered the centipede. I am not a slimy beast, the earthworm said. I am a useful and much loved creature. As any gardener you like, and as for you, I am a pest, the centipede announced, grinding broadly and looking round the room for approval. He is so proud of that, the ladybird said, smiling at James. So, for the life of me, I cannot understand why. I am the only pest in this room, cried the centipede, still grinding away. Unless you count old green grasshopper over there. But he is long past its now. He is too old to be past anymore. The old green grasshopper turned his huge black eyes upon the centipede and gave him a weltering look. Young fellow, he said, speaking in a deep, slow, scornful voice. I have never been a pest in my life. I am a musician. Here, said the ladybird. James, the centipede said. Your name is James, isn't it? Yes. Well, James, have you ever in your life seen such a marvelous colossal centipede as me? I certainly haven't, James answered. How on earth did you get to be like that? Very peculiar the centipede said. Very, very indeed. Let me tell you what happened. I was messing about in the garden under the old peach tree and suddenly a funny little green thing came ringling past my nose. Bright green it was and extraordinarily beautiful and it looked like some kind of tiny stones or crystal. Oh, but I know what that was, cried James. It happened to be too said the ladybird. And me, Miss Spider said. Suddenly, there were little green things everywhere. The soil was full of them. I actually swallowed one, the earthworm declared proudly. So did I, a ladybird said. I swallowed three, the centipede cried. But who's telling the story anyway? Don't interrupt. It's too late to tell the story now, the old green grasshopper announced. It's time to go to sleep. I refuse to sleep in my boots, the centipede cried. 
How many more uh, there are to come off, James? I think I've done about 20 so far, James told him. Then that leaves eight to go, the centipede said. 22, not 80, shrieked the earthworm. He's lying again. The centipede roared with laughter. Stop pulling the earthworm's legs, the ladybot said. They sent the centipede into hysterics. Pulling his leg, he cried, wriggling with glee and pointing at the earthworm. Which leg am I pulling? You tell me. James decided that he rather liked the centipede. He was obviously a rascal. But what a change it was to hear somebody laughing once in a while. He had never heard Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker laughing. We really must get some sleep, the old green grasshopper said. We've got a tough day ahead on tomorrow. So would you be kind enough, Miss Spider, to make the beds? 13. A few minutes later, Miss Spider had made the first bed. It was hanging from the ceiling, suspended by a rope of threads at either end so that actually it looked more like a hammock than a bed. But it was a magnificent affair, and the stuff that it was made of shimmered like silk in the pale light. I do hope you find it comfortable, Miss Spider said to the old green grasshopper. I made it as soft and silky as possible. I spoon with the gusama. That is a much better quality thread than the one I use for my own web. Thank you so much for that, my dear, the old green grasshopper said, climbing into the hammock. Ah, this is just what I needed. Good night, everybody. Then Miss Spider spun the next hammock, and the ladybird got in. After that, she spun along of the centipede and even longer for the earthworm. And how do you like your bed, she said to James. Hard or soft? I like it soft. Thank you very much, James answered. For goodness sake, stop staring round the room and get one with my boots, the centipede said. You and I are never going to get any sleep at this rate. And kindly line them up neatly in pairs as you take them off. Don't just throw them over your shoulder. James worked away frantically and the centipede's boots. Each one had laces that had to be untied and loosed before it could be pulled off. And to make matters worse, all the laces were tied up in the most terrible complicated knots that had to be unpicked with fingernails. It was just awful. It took about two hours, and by the time James had pulled off the last boot of all and had lined them up in the row on the floor, Twenty-one pairs also, the centipede was fast asleep. Wake up, centipede, whispered James, giving him a gentle dig in the stomach. It's time for your bed. Thank you, my dear child, the centipede said, opening his eyes. Then he got down off the sofa and ambled across the room and crawled into the hammock. James got into his hammock, and oh, how soft and comfortable it was with the hard bare boards that his aunt had always made him sleep upon at home. Light out, the centipede rolls. Nothing happened. Turn out the light, he called, raising his voice. James glanced around the room, wondering which of the others might be talking to, but they were all asleep. The gold-green grasshopper was snoring loudly through his nose. The ladybird was making whistling noises as she breathed, and the earthworm was coiled up like a spring at one end of his hemming whizzing and blowing through his open mouth. As for Miss Spider, she had made a lovely web for herself across one corner of the room, and James could see her crouching right in the very center of it, mumbling softly in her dreams. I said turn off the light, shouted the centipede angrily. Are you talking to me? James asked him. Of course I'm not talking to you, you ass, the centipede answered. That crazy glowworm has gone to sleep with her light on. For the first time since entering the room, James glanced up the ceiling, and there he saw a most extraordinary sight. 
something that looked like a giant fly without wings. It was at least three feet long, was standing upside down upon its six legs and in the middle of the ceiling, and the tail and of this creature seemed to be literally on fire. A brilliant greenish light, as bright and as the brightest electric bulb, was shining out of its tail and lighting up the whole room. It's that glow warmer, asked James, staring at the light. It doesn't look like a worm of any sort to me. Of course it's a glow worm, the centipede answered. At least that's what she calls herself. Also, actually, you are quite right. She isn't really a worm at all. Glow worms are never worms. They are simply lady fireflies without wings. Wake up, you lazy beast. But the glow worm didn't steer, so the centipede read out of his hammock and pick one of his boots from the floor. But out that wretched light, he shouted, hurling the boot up the ceiling. The glow worm slowly opened an eye and started at the centipede. There's no need to be rude, she said coldly. All in good time. Come on, shouted the centipede, or I put it out for you. Oh, hello, James, the glow worm said, looking down and giving James a little wave and smile. I didn't see you come in. Welcome, my dear boy, and good night. Then, click, and out went the light. James Henry Trottier lay down there in the darkness, with his eyes wide open, listening to the strange sleeping noise that the creature were making all around him, and wondering what on earth was going to happen to him in the morning. Already he was beginning to like his new friends very much. They were not nearly as terrible as they looked. In fact, they were not nearly terrible at all. They seemed extremely kind and helpful, in spite of all the shouting and arguing that went in between them. Good night, old green grasshopper, he was whispered. Good night, ladybird. Good night, Miss Wider. But he, before he could go through them all, he had fallen fast asleep. 14. We are off, some was shouting. We are off at last. James woke up with a jump and looked about him. The creatures were all out of their hand marks and moving externally around the room. Suddenly, the floor grave, a great heaven, as saw an earthquake were taking place. Here we go, shouted the old green grasshopper, hopping up and down with excitement. Hold on tight. What's happening, cried James, leaping off his hammock. What's going on? The ladybird, who has obviously a kind and gentle creature, came over and stood beside him. In case you don't know it, she said, we are about to depart. For every form, the top of the ghastly hill that we all been living on for so long. We are about to roll away inside this great, big, beautiful peach to land of. Of what? asked James. Never you mind, said the ladybird, but nothing could be worse than his desolate hilltop on those two repulsive ounce of yours. Hear, hear, they all shouted. You may not have noticed it, the ladybird went on, but the whole garden, even before it reached the step edge of the hill, happens to be one a steep slop. And therefore, the only thing that has been stopping the speech from rolling away right from the beginning is the thick steam attached to the tree. Break the stem and off we go. Watch it, cried Mr. Spider as the room gave another violent lurch. Here we go. No, n not quite. At this moment, continued the ladybird, our centipede, who has a pair of jaws as sharp as razors, is up there on the top of the peach, nibbling away at the stem. In fact, he must be nearly through it, as you can tell from the way we are lunching about. Would you like me to take you under my wings? so that you won't fall over when we start rolling? That's very kind of you, said Mrs. James, but I think I'll be all right. 
Just then, the centipede stuck his grinding face through a hole in the ceiling and shouted, I've done it, we are off. The journey begins, shouted the centipede, and who knows where it will end, muttered the earthworm. If you have anything to do with it, it can only mean trouble. Nonsense, said the ladybird. We are now about to visit the most marvelous places and see the most wonderful things. Isn't that so, centipede? There is no knowing what we shall see, cried the centipede. We may see a creature with nine heads who lives in the desolate snow and whenever he catches the cold he has 49 nose to blow. We might see the venomous pink spotted scrunch who can chew up a man with one bite. It likes to eat five of them roasted for lunch and 18 for its super at night. We may see a dragon And nobody knows that we won't see a unicorn there. We may see a terrible monster with toes growing out of the tufts of his hair. We may see the sweet little bitty bride, hen so playful, so kind and well-bred. And such beautiful eggs, you just boil them and then they explode and they blew off your head. Ignu and Ignorus, surely you see, and that Gnormus and Gnoblignat, who sting when it stings, your goes in a knee and comes out through the top of your hut. And we may even get lost and be frozen by frost. We may die in an earthquake or tremor. Or nestier still, we may even be tossed on the horns of a perilous dilemma. But who cares? Let us go from this horrible hill. Let us rock, let us bowl, let us plunge. Let's go rolling and bowling and spinning until we are away from the old spiker and sponge. One second later, slowly and slowly, oh, most gentle, the great peach started to learn forward and steal into marriage. The whole room began to tilt over and all the furniture went sliding across the floor and crashed against the far wall. So did James and the ladybird and the old green grasshopper and Miss Spider and the earthworm and also the centipede who had just came slithering quickly down the wall. 15. Outside in the garden at the very moment, Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker had just taken their places at the front gate, each with a bunch of tickets in her hand, and the first stream of early morning strictness was visible in the distance climbing up the hill to the view of the peach. We shall make a furniture today, Aunt Spiker was saying, just look at all those people. I wonder what became of the horrid little boy of our last night, Aunt Sponge said. He never did come back in, did he? He probably fell down in the dark and broke his leg, Aunt Spiker said. Or his neck, maybe, Aunt Sponge was said, hopefully. Just wait till I get my hands on him, Aunt Spiker said, waving her cane. He never want to stay out all night again. Good gracious me, what's that awful noise? Both women swung around the lock. The noise, of course, had been caused by the giant peach crashing through the fence that surrounded it. And now gathering speed every second, it came rolling across the garden towards the place where Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker were standing. They gaped, they screamed, they started to run. They panicked. They both got in each other's way. They began pushing and jostling and each one of them was thinking only about saving themselves. Aunt Sponge at the fat on tripped over a box that she'd brought along to keep the money in and fell flat on her face. Aunt Spiker immediately tripped over Aunt Sponge and came down on the top of her. 
They both lay on the ground, frightening and glaring and yelling and struggling frantically to get up again. But before they could do this, the mighty peach was upon them. There was a crunch. And then there was silence. The peach rolled on, and behind it, out Sponge and Spike lay ironed out open the grass, as flat and thin and lives as a couple of paper dolls cut out of the picture book. 16. Mm. 16 I will read in the next I think because the book is so big, I make two different um, parts out of it. So this was now part one from James and the Giant Peach. I have to say it is by far now the favorite book of mine. And I can't wait how it will turn out. This book was written by Rohal Dahl and I read myself here in this ASMR channel through all the Rohal Dahl books as well. He also made Charlie and the Chocolate Fabric and Matilda. If you like that little episode then feel free to follow, subscribe, click on the notification bell and comment. Because only with your support, I have the opportunity to let this ASMR channel grow even further. And then we will see where this adventure will lead us. My name is ASMR Cuts and I'm a heavily tattooed red girl who go with you on the adventure of sound. I not only read books, I have mukbang videos, I also have... Um, videos where I share with some friends the experience of ASMR and for sure everything in the best quality to provide you with the most amazing sound you can find here on YouTube. So I hope that you are in the next part again with me where I will read James and the Giant Peach part 2. And if you are interested in even more books, then click yourself through my playlists where you find all the ASMR content I've created until now. I wish you a pleasant time and I hope we see us soon.